you have the on-screen headers? That's what I have. All right, get the on-screen headers and then go from there. All right, so Barbara, we will do, uh, I'm going to do some headlines first, and then Great. we'll welcome you on, and I'll pass the uh, computer to the center. Okay. And then uh, you run point on the uh, interview. Okay, I just gave you some of the questions that we had for them, so Fantastic. that's a copy for you. Fantastic. Guys, we're going to get started shortly. Thank you for your patience. Give us about... Uh, 90 seconds and we'll get started. A lot of good news to get to. At 1 o'clock today, Albemarle County's Board of Supervisors are going to determine whether or not we're going to go to Phase 2 from Phase 3, which we're in now. So this is a pretty important meeting that's happening. We'll talk about that. Barbara Lundgren has been kind enough to join us in studio. And Barbara, give us a tease of who you're welcoming to the show. We will have Eric Myers uh, with the Virginia Health Department, and he's an environmental specialist. Uh, they were not able to join us at uh, in our show with the Virginia Weddings and Events Showcase last week, so they've kindly joined us today, and we'll be able to answer some questions that we did not get answered last week. Fantastic. And we will put this over here. We love when the fairy godmother is here, the star of the Virginia Wedding and Events Showcase. Um, it's a big day for weddings. Today. It is a big day for weddings. It is a big day for weddings. We were just getting started, and now more questions. I know, it's... More questions. I, can I say this? I don't know how you feel. Say whatever say you this. want, Jerry. <laughs> I mean, it is frustrating. It, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, momentum was happening. Yeah. Yeah. You guys were doing we were. it the right way? Yes. We, had, uh, we were waiting to hear from King Family and the catering outfit about their wedding on Saturday. It went right. very well. Everything went very well, and they're doing it right. Um, and what Eric will tell us today is uh, how we are working as a team. Right. They are working with us. Um, not so sure from what I'm hearing on the Board of Supervisors. Right. Let's... Um, Cross our fingers. <laughs> yeah. We need to work as a team on that, too. Um, Isn't it kind of crazy that six people are determining this? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And really How can we change that? And really, Jared? there's more influential yeah. ones than others. Yeah. Which is, yeah. that's safe, right? I, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. We're going to talk about that. So why don't you run headlines with us today? Oh, you want to do that? Okay, yeah. I will do my best. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I, I've been on one track. Right I know now. you have. I know you have. If you don't have anything to say, nothing to say. You don't okay. need that to uh, till we start, okay. and then I'll push this in. I'm playing with it. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Judah, you're an amazing human being. If you guys had Judah any rocks. idea what Judah was doing this morning today, um, I salute you. We will be drinking a beer, my friend, at 5:30 on company time. Uh, and it will be well earned, <laughs> don't you think? That maybe it's going to be a five o'clock. Okay, four thirty cold beer. Judith says my All friends right. are coming over at four, so I'm going to be ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, there today. you go. Okay. What is your drink yeah. of choice to start the day? Uh, today, I, um, I haven't decided. I'll probably on, be on rosé today. Rosé is good. Yeah, Perfect day yeah, for rose. yeah. The cousins are coming over. The cousins. The cousins. My sister and the cousins are coming over. Okay, that's like a. Four to six week adventure. Very nice. Very yeah, nice. Every, every four to six weeks. <laughs> Guys, give the show a like and a share. We're going to get started here momentarily um, on the I Love Seville show with special guest Barbara Lundgren in studio. Um, J Dubs, um, you are working miracles right now. Um, you let us know what you need. I've got the first two in. You got the skin online? You have the theme? The skin? All right, why don't we do this and then do it as we go? Okay, and just you can just keep it, um, Barbara and I, on a two shot side by side. That way, that'll allow you some time to get that the shows. All right, guys, give it a like and a share. Stephanie Wells Road says hello, Stephanie. We love you on this show. Hello, Stephanie. Um, Tim sharing the show. Folks, Keswick watching. This is going to be a good show. We're ready to rock and roll when you are, sir.
Guys, good Wednesday afternoon. My name is Jerry Miller, and welcome to the I Love Seville show. We're live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville network. Thank you for your patience. About nine minutes late of a start. We're going to make it up for you, we promise. A lot of news we're going to get to today. Phase two, potentially on the horizon for Albemarle County. We're in phase three now. Six people in the county determine if we're going to go to phase two. That meeting happens in 19 minutes. I would encourage anyone that's watching this program, if you can open up another computer or a phone and track what's happening at one o'clock in this Board of Supervisors meeting, because it's of great importance for this community. We're gonna talk the importance of college football financially um, from a hospitality standpoint. And now the NCAA is asking for athletes to be tested 72 hours in advance of a game. Well, what happens in the three days after they get tested, before the results are in? So that's a question we have for you guys. We're going to talk about um, college professors at, at Duke and maybe UVA getting furloughed or losing their jobs. Tenured track professors, I mi madre, and the Virginia Film Festival is announcing a shift to a virtual format. CBS 19 has terminated their sports director yesterday because there's no sports and surprisingly he went into the office and his boss pulled him aside and said sports doesn't move the needle because they're none you don't have a job i'm sorry so this is a great guy a great guy um judah wickhauer is our director why don't we first um go to studio and then go to two shots so we can have barbara how are you doing I slept last night, not so much a couple of nights before. I don't know. I don't know why. You look beautiful. Just, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Didn't do a t-shirt today. You look great. It's, it's not a wedding showcase today. But, uh, <laughs> and I didn't bring chocolate. That, that was an oversight. That was an oversight. <laughs> But uh, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm yeah. doing well. Barbara's yeah. the star of the Virginia Wedding and Event Showcase tomorrow at 1015. J-Dubs, if you want to get the first one on screen about phase two, I'm going to get out of your way on this. 17 minutes, six people determine phase three to phase two, potentially, Barbara. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, some people called their supervisors about this. Um, and didn't, we didn't get some great feedback on that. Uh, I heard that um, one representative wanted to hold businesses accountable for enforcing people to wear face masks. Um, How does that work? I, it, it, it can't. We, right. We've talked about that at length on this show, um, on, on the Thursday show. Um, it's, it's a private event in, in a sense, um, and... All the vendors are doing their job with masks, they're checking temperatures, they're screening, they're just doing everything they can uh, in terms of what's mandatory, what's best practices, they're doing everything they possibly can. And we talk, we, we keep the lines of communication open with the couple and we have an understanding going into an event or a wedding and um, it's up to them. Right. And same as going into the grocery stores. It's been the, you know. Um, we're still walking into the stores and finding people not wearing masks. Well, well even a trickier situation, it's, you know, you know, I have a lot of friends that are restaurant owners. They're asking team members to mm -hmm. be at the front door of their restaurants. And when people walk in, they're saying, look, we have a sign on the window. You mm -hmm. need to wear a mask to come mm -hmm. in the restaurant. And they're allocating a team member to try to do this as well. Right. Still, some people, and folks, still we're eight people, we're eight feet apart mm -hmm. here, Barbara and I. Still, mm -hmm. some people are not doing it. And it puts right. the team member in such a precarious position. It it's it's very hard. And they're not getting paid for that. <laughs> Two thirteen an hour to right, do that. Right. Yeah. I it's, mean that's nuts. And, and people are mean. How do you it, think it's going to shake out mean? at one o'clock? Yeah. Uh, it, it's scary. Do you think it's, it's going to go to two? Um, Two point five was mentioned. Okay. Don't know how that works. Maybe okay. that's numbers. Okay. Maybe so that's, that's kind of like a hybrid a lot of speculation out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to yeah. follow it. It's at. 15 minutes from now, this meeting... Somebody get back to us. Someone please get back to us and put it on the live feed on the show. Give us a snapshot on who's coming on in 12 minutes today. Um, Eric Myers from the Department of Health, Virginia Department of Health, the Thomas Jefferson District, is coming on, and he is an environmental specialist. They could not join us last week when we had uh, Rebecca on, 
and um, Catherine, sorry. Catherine Goodman. Catherine Goodman, yeah. when Catherine Goodman was on. And um, so he is going to try to answer some of the questions that we did not cover last week. So they're going to join us, guys. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson Health District and T-minus nine minutes on today's program. J-Dubs, you got the second header ready to go, UVA Sports. All right, you are an amazing human being. Judah Wickhauer, I love you, I love you, I love you. I switch to just you. Yeah, let's, let's do that. And when we welcome Barbara, we'll do this. We're doing this on the fly. All right, first headline, my friend. College football, um, we're trying to play in 2020. I mean, let me just throw this out there. We would just like a decision of what's going to happen with college football. Of course, from a community standpoint, um, we would love to see football being played, but we just want a decision so these hotel blocks can be opened up and used for something else. Here's something that's impacting college football. NCAA, um, the governing body of college athletics, wants athletes to have a 72-hour test before a game. So it suggests that football players are tested once a week, 72 hours before a game. The question everybody's asking, if this test happens on a, so that would be a Wednesday, what happens on a Thursday, Friday, and, and, and going into the game time on Saturday? Judah Wickhauer, our director, put a perfect snapshot of this. He got tested for his family because he's a phenomenal son, and Ann and Big Jim Wickhauer are phenomenal people, and he had to wait eight days before he got his results. So this guy, who's an extremely reasonable and intelligent person, literally said, why am I waiting eight days for my results? Judah Wickhauer, yes, sir. And I've seen, I've seen Twitter uh, tweets from people claiming that they had to wait 10 days. 10 days. 10 days. I mm -hmm. saw the same thing. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? I got a friend that waited 10 days for his results. And he humored his wife, right, to get the test. And it came back 10 days later, and she wanted another test. Because you're like, she said, you've seen Seriously? people in 10 days. You know? I mean. Just get one every day. I mean, they're only like, you know, $180. <laughs> yeah, that's right? tongue-in-cheek from Judah Wickhauer. All right, let's get the fairy godmother in the mix. What do you make of this topic right here? There is a question to the health department today, and they didn't, this came to me just before I, I left home. Um, does an employer have to have the employee tested before returning to work if they've been on vacation? Great question. Okay. So, um, or is that employee quarantined? Right now, we are requiring our employees to be tested before returning to work, but getting the test results uh, in 7 to 14 days. So, they can't come back from vacation. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, so they get a three-week vacation? Three-week vacation. Right. Right, and, and their job they're, might be not there when they get back. Right. Yeah. So we'll talk about There's this with no Eric. There's no answers here. Yeah, maybe no he'll answers. offer some insight for us. It's a tough spot, and I'll tell you this. Yeah. Why don't we throw this out there? We're not judging. It's a tough spot for everybody. We're just saying this is what's happening. Exactly. It, 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 there's, there's no time to think it through. And in my conversations with Eric Myers, who's coming on, um, they're doing the best they can. There are no answers. Every day there are more questions and no answers. Thomas Jefferson yeah. Health District in the spotlight in T-minus six minutes. We'll go to the next one, JW. You've got a lot of people watching, and I think you let folks know this gentleman was coming on the show. I Because tried. there are a lot of people watching here. Um, Judah, the next question, the next headline is the financial impact of football. Guys, this puts it in perspective here, and this is a direct correlation to Charlottesville, Virginia. So on opening weekend, the, there's three games, three big-time games that are um, expected to be played. And you got, ladies and gentlemen, Florida State and West Virginia, Georgia and Virginia, Auburn and North Carolina. They're set for games one, weeks one and two in Atlanta. The guys from the Peach Bowl out of Atlanta, the CEO, Gary Stoken, he estimates that this has a $100 million impact on the city of Atlanta when Florida State and West Virginia, Georgia and Virginia, and Auburn and North Carolina play in week one and week two in hot Atlanta. A hundred million dollars. Um, so he's basically saying if these three games do not happen for this community, we have an impact of over a hundred million dollars from tourism, hospitality, hotels, 
food and beverage. When people go to one of these games, they're not just going to the game. As we all know, we're eating wings, we're drinking beer, we're having cocktails, we're buying clothes to support our team, we're staying in hotels, we're taking Ubers, we're buying newspapers. I mean, it's startling. So the Peach Bowl CEO said if we don't have these three games in week one and week two in Atlanta, Florida State, West Virginia, Georgia and Virginia, and Auburn and North Carolina, expect a $100 million negative impact for this city. You have been in this town a long time. You know the impact of football. What do you think about this? Well, I was just going to say, there's a trickle down from that too. You stayed in town. Yeah, that's right. You you built your life at UVA. You stayed in town. But then there's so many others who went to UVA. They left. They come back for their weddings. They come back here to get wedding to get to get married, and just to get married. Then they leave, and we don't school their children. And but that's tourism. Sure. Okay. Let's go down that road. So you're basically yeah. saying anytime someone can go back and watch a football game, it's an opportunity for them to fall in love with Charlottesville again. Right. Right. They do, and they they come, they visit, they leave. There we're we're getting their their tax revenue for their visit, but we're not schooling their children, you know, and, and it's, there's a trickle down and they're, they're coming back year after year after year. Your dad went to UVA, you went to UVA, your brother went to UVA. And, and then you, if your brother left and he might want to get married in, in, in Charlottesville or in Albemarle County, it's all over the place. I, I never have. I, probably 90% of my couples don't live here. They don't live here. They just fell in love with Charlottesville for some reason or another. Or went to UVA. Or they, it, it's a, a lot of our couples, um, part of the families in the north, part of the families in the south, and Charlottesville's right in between. And it's convenient to travel. I have um, a best friend that lives in Fairfield, Connecticut. He and I went to UVA together. And he, his family, um, his wife and two kids, they come down for a couple of football games every year um, and a basketball game. And he's doing, uh, he's being a great dad. His son loves football. As a dad, he went to UVA. He would love his kid went there. Mm -hmm. So he's like, let me show you the fun stuff that we did. Mm -hmm. And he's concerned. He goes, look, if, if, if my son doesn't have this experience, does he consider... Connecticut, UConn Huskies, as right. opposed to the UVA Cavaliers. Right, right. So this is right. pretty serious. It's, it's very serious. It's all serious. And, you know, I told you last week, it's breaking my heart, that my granddaughter Softball and her, her senior year, her, the whole senior experience, you know, and we already went through a year of seniors who did the best they could to get through their senior year. We're going to go through it again. Will you put that in perspective? Because everybody thinks <laughs> that um, when, when athletes go to college, they think it's like, you know, football, basketball, full scholarship guys, they have the glory, the superstars. Mm -hmm. That's a small percentage. Mm -hmm. Your granddaughter has been working her tail off for a long Since time. Since she was five years old. And, and this is a huge window for exposure. Mm -hmm. And her father's her coach. He's the coach at, at Monticello. It's killing him, too. Right? <laughs> it's killing all of them. They, they, they live and breathe their sports. And my other, the, her younger sister is a basketball star, and she's down the same path. So yeah. we'll follow that story closely yeah. here. Judah, what I'd like to do is I'd like to reach out um, to Eric um, so we can get him on the line. It's about 12.55 or so. We, Fairy Godmother Barbara Lundgren has got a rock star guest for us on today's show. So what we want to do is we want to see if we can get him on the line, and we have him on the line. Um, Eric, we'll get you to turn that camera on if you could, sir, so we can okay. see you. All you do, tap that screen and turn it on. Okay, fantastic. All right, we have Eric. Judah, thank you. Judah, you're killing it today. Seriously, Judah Wickhauer. He's been challenged. Oh, my gosh. Two, two <laughs> cold beers on the clock for Judah Wickhauer Always today. up to the challenge. Um, there, all right, Judah. so we're going to go to Eric. I'm going to get out of your way, sir. Before we talk shop, introduce yourself, Eric, personally, who you are. Sure. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, again, my name is Eric Myers. I work with the local health department here in association with the Virginia Department of Health. I have um, I've been, been an employee here in the district for about 25 years. September will be 26 years. 
So I'm turning into a long-term employee. Um, I enjoy working with a staff. I'm a supervisor, just step, one step up from the field, and I work with five inspectors uh, full-time for food safety and some other general environmental programs. So we're the ones who look at um, child care operations, uh, you know, retail restaurants all the way up to UVA and Martha Jefferson Hospital, temporary events, and we're promoting food safety during normal times. Uh, during the spring of this year with COVID-19, we kind of split our team in half. Some of us became contact uh, COVID-19 tracers working to help our epidemiology team. And this is very similar to what we did with H1N1 in 2009, where we helped with vaccination clinics, uh, mobile vaccination clinics. So um, I've enjoyed working in public health, and I've, um, I, I like working behind the scenes to improve things. And uh, if any of you have ever traveled to a developing country, sometimes uh, you'll see things out in the open because they don't have a good public infrastructure yet. Uh, I've m traveled multiple times in East Africa and you know, have seen firsthand why public health uh, system is so important. So I, I'm all about prevention and people. Uh, my wife and I live in Northern Albemarle County. We have three kids and um, one's getting ready to leave the home. She just graduated from college. So uh, we're kind of in that stage of life right now. But again, thank you for this opportunity. Look forward to the conversation. I want to thank you as well because I know how busy you are <laughs> and, and you. you for taking this time and all of your colleagues there. Thank, uh, thanks to all of you for taking this time last week and this week with us. And you've sure. been on the ball and we appreciate it so much. Amen. Um, and I'll thanks. explain to some of the viewers who have not been with us in, in the previous shows. Um, we were put into phase three with uh, unclear guidelines for weddings and events. So we have been bombarding your offices with questions that you didn't have the answers to. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been very confusing. We've gotten some crazy answers, and we're trying to um, all get on the same page. With that, you have 35 health districts in the state. Is that correct? Okay. That is correct. And we are the unusual industry that we cross those lines. So we couldn't go into all the guidelines like restaurants. We were, the closest guidelines for us were restaurants and uh, special events like stadiums or such, or something like that. Um, but they are, they don't cross lines and we do. So um, we are working with you to try to get on the same page in, in case I go to Northern Virginia and do a wedding. And we want to make sure. So um, we talked about that this morning, Eric. Um, the best thing for me to do would be to, I'm going to do that wedding. I call ahead and say, hey, this is what we're doing in Charlottesville. So is this what I should be doing there? Is that correct? I, I yeah, I would encourage you, At this as, point. as I mentioned this morning, that the local health department is, uh, you know, that old expression, many irons in the fire right now, we're, we, we, it's really true. And we're trying to triage things daily, um, prioritize. We, we're we're kind of wired to answer questions and research things and help everyone who asks for help. It's just the volume right now is challenging. But I do think it's a sound principle if, uh, you know, industry person, uh, if they're going into local health department, try to find maybe their environmental health uh, technical consultant and say, this, generally, this is what we're doing. We're having a social gathering of 250 or less during phase three. Uh, I, I know you can't review our specific plans, but, you know, is there any special guidance that you need uh, uh, to tell our group? Because we're working with the family. We're working with the venue. Um, I would recommend that. So okay. if, um, you know, just, just as a positive way to interact with the health department. So, and you and I have had several conversations about how things would be enforced, say, mask wearing. And the question came up this morning since we've talked. Um, 
in that our Board of Supervisors here is about to meet in a moment. Two minutes. Or in two minutes. Um, they are about okay. to meet to um, talk about going into phase two. Um, we've heard from one of the supervisors that they their idea would be to hold businesses accountable for enforcing people at events, the guest in particular, to wear face masks. Um, now, does that mean the bride's coming down the aisle in a mask? You know, crazy stuff like that. Um, and But holding the businesses, all the businesses, the venue, the... Sure. so. If it came down to that, what's your take on that? Is that coming to you because you have the um, the form on your website where the complaint is lodged, right? So how can we address that? That, that is correct. We're getting, uh, we're kind of developing a centralized system, uh, and we're receiving about fifty, on average, complaints a day, just from all you know, from hair salons, restaurants, big box stores. Um, and to you all's credit, we've had zero complaints on from the wedding venue. Go um, team! All right, all oh, right. Oh, so that's keep, wonderful whatever news. Whatever you doing, keep it up. Um, but I want the board of supervisors to hear that as well. <laughs> Someone tell Ann Malley. Someone tell Ann Malley. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no problem. It's so there, there's probably a distinction here. If a locality passes a local ordinance, and we are are operating under emergency orders from the governor to state employees there there's an interpretation I would have to ask my management where it may be because it's a local ordinance if, if the county of Almar or whatever county decides to do that they may have to use local law enforcement to do that unless we are authorized by the you know the governor to assist with that so uh, that's kind of my understanding with between local state government. Uh, I, you know, we, we would seek seek clarification on that. Uh, you, know, you and I talked about was, uh, you know, would is the health department locally planning routine uh, random surveys of events? And I talked to my manager, and we're totally in agreement that that is not our priority. Um, we are. Uh, we have higher priority complaints coming in and that we're actually starting this week, we're working with ABC on some of our food service locations that uh, may be challenged to meet some of these emergency orders. So uh, we would respond to a complaint. Let's say we had a wedding venue and someone took digital pictures and we would, we always start with education because it's kind of like, how do you, how would you want to be treated? And and I I would much rather be someone call me and say, Hey Mr. Myers, you got we noticed this gathering, we you know, this didn't appear to meet the guidelines by these digital pictures. Can you do better? Can you can you can you can you work on that? So uh, that is our approach. Education first. Uh, you know, there is a there is a move that I will be honest, you know, and I feel it as a state employee to to, you know, for places that continue to be non-compliant, I'll put it that way, to start taking some type of action. So, uh, because uh, you know, we, we know face coverings can help with you know curbing the you know the epidemiological curve. So, didn't mean to talk too much. No, no, no. no. Was great. This is all good stuff. Yeah, good stuff. Um, we talked about the differences between mandatory and best practices. Right. I'm going to let you run with that. And, okay, thank you. It, <laughs> you know, the, the mandatory is, you know, under emergency orders from the governor of Virginia, which are authorized uh, through the, you know, Gem General Assembly to, they have the force of law. So if the governor says XYZ is a mandate, under this emergency situation we're still in with this global pandemic that's also in Virginia, uh, that has, in a sense, a, the force of law. So uh, that's that's one side. The other side is best practices, which some of this is gleaned from the Centers for Disease Control. They they're science based, uh, practical ways, and um, I have a copy right here. You probably saw it through, um, you know, the Executive Phase Three guidelines for social gatherings. That any any 
part of your industry could review. Um, <laughs> as we talked this morning, it's kind of you know challenging because right. there's a lot to. So. Let me throw this question to you, Eric. Um, let's say you have. I'm just any business. The business has a call to action flyer on their door, like most of them do. You cannot enter here without a face mask on. Then the business is allocating one of their most precious commodities, someone on their staff, to greet people upon arrival saying, look, you have to wear a mask when you come, when you come into this business. A lot of them are also doing this. And they have the call, they have right. the flyer on the door, they have the flyers in the dining rooms, they have the flyers at the venues, and then they're allocating personnel to enforcing this or reminding people to do it. What happens if people still do not cooperate with those instructions? H how is that particular venue or business, what more can they do? Right. Super question. Um, and as you're probably aware of, there is a medical exemption. And under Americans, Americans with Disabilities Act, you know, under, you know, health privacy, people aren't supposed to ask, you know, like, you don't carry a medical card. So, uh, and then there's another issue of, of staff safety. I've talked to multiple managers now, you know, grocery stores, other locations uh, that are concerned about their staff, you know, when it comes to having an 18-year-old confront a 55-year-old man who's not in right. the mood. You know? Who's so, hangry. <laughs> Those are, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. it's, it's reality um, of what we're, what we're working with. Uh, I think we are making lots of progress with, uh, especially some of these larger stores, of them having masks to face coverings to hand out to individuals. Uh, so that, that's one way to help. I, I do, hopefully it's going to be more normalized on that way. I'm still trying to, trying to research. I read something yesterday from our central office that was talking about uh, reasonable accommodation. So if a business chose to say uh, that, you know, we can't have you come in here because you, you, you're not wearing the face covering. That's that under 67 order, emergency order, you have to need to do it. Uh, then there's one interpretation that I need that my management needs to verify is under Americans with Disabilities Act, you have to offer reasonable accommodation. They say, sir, ma'am, if it's a restaurant, we can actually seat you outside. You know, right here, you don't have to wear a mask. You got, you got your own table, and that's good. That's a reasonable accommodation. Uh, if it's, you know, uh, we can deliver to your car, curbside pickup. We can, you know, again, if it's a restaurant. Now, it becomes more challenging if, you know, the hardware store, grocery store, it's this essential commodity. Um, so, I, to be very honest, I, it's hard to have a clear answer to that question. As is so much. <laughs> yeah, it's so nebulous. It's so nebulous. So much is hard to answer. Okay, I'm, I'm going to toss something out to you that came, before. I don't know if you were watching earlier, but... Um, so you have a staff person who goes on vacation. Does the employer have to have that employee tested before returning to work? Okay, they've gone, they've gone uh, on vacation, uh, say they Somewhere. went to Mexico. Yeah. Okay. Um, Just as long as it's not the Bahamas. Because we can't <laughs> go there right now. <laughs> right. Um, does the employer have to have that employee tested before returning to work, or is that employee quarantined or what? Right now, we are uh, this this business is requiring our employees to be tested before returning to work, but get it, but the test results don't come back for seven to fourteen days. That way, they're not coming back to work for three weeks. They have a three week vacation, or they're not paid for two weeks, or they lose their job, like Jerry pointed out. Um, what is happening? What your take on that? I know maybe okay. no answers. <laughs> Just to let you know, I'm at the local level here aware of no requirement from the state directing to, at this time, to employers saying you must test your employees okay. if they've been out of the area or even to a hot spot somewhere in the country or out of the country. So I'm not aware of that. Um, I do know it would appear that employers may have the ability to require that, but that that could be a worker employer you know 
discussion issue. Um, Maybe temperature checks would be the thing, the way to go. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a really good mm -hmm. screening uh, criteria. And um, we, with on the food industry side, we work a lot with employee health policies that talk about symptoms, you know, unrelated to COVID. But we're also working those in now. And actually, under state law, they're required to report to their employer. If, you know, if they're starting to have jaundice or, you know, diarrhea, vomiting, things like that, prior to reporting to work. So uh, a lot of it, it, what I've seen in the food industry is the culture of the management, the culture of the corporation, if it's a big group. Uh, if they're committed to safety, it, it really helps the employees have that understanding. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Jerry, go to you. Yeah, I'm going to throw this okay. one to you. So, Eric, you have a lot of questions coming in. Um, live on, what, 12 Facebook pages, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter, Eric. So you got a lot of questions coming in. Um, this one is an intriguing one for you. Okay. Um, I'm going to get out of your way on this. There is a festival, okay. a festival this past weekend called Lock-In in Nelson County. And Lock-In announced this weekend that they are going to do an in-person festival this fall in October in Nelson. Um, I don't know, Eric, if you've been to any festivals. I've been to some festivals. They're a heck of a lot of fun. Um, you're outside. It's crowded. You're partying. You're having a good time. I'm going to leave it at that. In some cases, you're sleeping and camping out. I'm going to throw the, sure. the lock-in concept to you of having a festival in October and your thoughts on that. And the second part of the question I have for you, in the press release, when lock-in announced that they were having this festival in October, they said they were going to try to do on-site testing with results available immediately. So the second part of the question is, how can a festival deliver results immediately when our director, Judah Wickhauer, is waiting eight days for his results? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, it's good to have a challenge. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, so, um, just to let you know, we have, when lock -in started back in 2013, their first festival, because they have, it's a mass gathering, and just a little background here, uh, and they have, I think that that year they had 53 food vendors. Uh, we're involved with the inspections of those food vendors and uh, the water supply and the sewage disposal for, uh, they were having maybe, they were planning on 25,000. I think they, that year they got about 20 perhaps. Um, in the little, later years, we've been around 15, 16,000, I believe. Uh, so it is a very big concern because we have people coming from all over, literally the everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I was down there one year and they had, you know, some figures of how many states people were from, and it was, you know, it's great. People, people like to have you know these outdoor festivals, but right now we are in a pandemic. Um, I know that Nelson County has their own um, local uh, approval, like special use. So I'm sure the Nelson County Board would have to consider all of this and that's their purview um, whether that's a threat to their population there or not uh, and i have no doubt that the um, our central office working in association with the health commissioner and the governor's office would have important input on that and um, we have had some discussions with lock-in back in may but we haven't had those any more since then so um in regards to the immediate testing, I, you know, I've heard about a few things on the media where, you know, how accurate are those tests? Uh, that would be a good question. And, are they uh, accurate, Eric? But it, I, I don't have figures on, you know, how accurate. Only I've only heard like most other people, media reports saying some of these may have error rates that are, you know, I don't, I don't know how well you could trust them, but. If it's something FDA recognized, approved, that would be something to, uh, you know, to consider. But I think the biggest question is how and is it a go, no go on, on the festival? And if it's a go, you know, if we're still at phase three, does that mean it's a thousand people? So, uh, again, I don't have answers to all this. This is important. 
you know, this, the, just like we're talking about, that your people who are watching this, they have businesses, and lock-in is a business. And so we try to not only care about public health, but we recognize we live in a community where, where people, you know, have to make a living, too. So um, we would just have to take it step-by-step step with lock-in. And um, we've had good communication with them in the past, and I, I would expect that to to move forward. So, do you have anything? Else? Yeah, yeah, I have a follow up. So, more okay. qu Eric, you're a popular guy right now. Um, you are. Oh no, you're a very popular guy. All right, so s schools. How about schools? I mean, I'm going to get out of your way on this topic. Kids, mask, and schools. I mean, I have a two year old. I don't know if you have kids. My two-year-old can't do anything for more than 20 seconds before his attention shifts to something else. So I, I guess the question is, mask in schools, how is that going to play out? Schools moving forward, what's going to happen? I mean, every parent has this question. Eric, your thoughts? Yes, um, I know that Governor Northam had a press briefing on the 14th of July. And I'm just trying to read through some of that, but uh, it says... You know, his response, Department of Education has set out guidelines for reopening schools. Local school boards will make the final decisions on their plans to move forward. Schools are ready to shift plans as needed. So that was from the 14th, uh, you know, 2020, uh, July, uh, from the governor's press briefing. So what I've seen locally is it's individual school districts, uh, you know, having the uh, the authority to say, okay, we're we're going five days a week, or we're doing a hybrid learning a week for high school, middle school. Uh, you know, I have seen some some plans or diagrams of people, you know, uh, using the gyms and having desks and using high school space for elementary things like that. Uh, but it, when it card regards when it regards to face coverings, I definitely definitely get the the challenge that would be with with young kids and uh, I know it says in the guidelines anyone under 10 is exempt from having to wear it you know from from previous orders from from the governor's office uh, uh, but I do should parents be nervous about the setting their kids decisions. to in-person school Eric you know I think it's natural for all of us that, you know, whether we have kids or, or we have um, family that, you know, that nieces, nephews, whoever, we're in, you know, this uncertain time, I, I, it's totally, totally you know, understandable to have, have concern. Uh, I know that it, it appears that, you know, children can become infected, but the rate of um, serious complications and associated deaths appear much, much lower than with the higher age groups. And this, this is one message I wanted to get in with, with the wedding industry uh, or planning industry is some of these venues, you know, having older family members, you know, 65 plus coming, it may be wise to advise the families, hey, can we, can we set up a good, uh, you know, Skype link or, you know, other type, you know, Zoom link or whatever, um, to have these older members still be participating, but not have that risk. So, yep, we're working um, on that too. We're working okay. on that too. And, so, yeah, and Barbara, you said something last week when we were talking about just the challenges of reworking events. So, so you know, let's say you had something planned for, you know, early April 2020. And suddenly, you know, we need to delay that by six months or a year. And you're you're working um, double duty, you know, for for what did it again this week? Yeah, half price. Yeah, what he's saying. Yeah, right. Rescheduled another yeah. one this week. And, yep. And, yeah, like you mentioned in one of your emails, or we were talking about, uh, you're kind of counseling them, like, okay, you know, have you thought about this? Have you, mm -hmm. you know, can we do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I you know I just want to I just want to let you know that um, we're just not some kind of blind bureaucratic agent. That's what I love about yeah, this. You so guys have I, crushed it. Eric. Yeah, and and again, thank you for listening to us right. and taking our calls and truly 
having that compassion, I'm asking the board of supervisors not doing it. <laughs> to have the same. Right. It, what you said, Eric, how would you like to be treated? You know, we all need to have that. I agree. <laughs> Every moment of the Empathy. day, how would you like to be treated at the door yeah. when sure. when you or when you go to a restaurant? How would you like to be treated if you were at the door and had that job? Who you know, walk a mile in my shoes. You and know? you know what? One of the things, Eric, I'm going to give you a lot of props. Eric, you have a lot of people watching you now. I'm going to give you a lot of props. He even said, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And that I, yeah. goes a long that way. Does go a long with way with leaders in the community. If yeah. they openly say, "I don't know," it's nebulous, right. as opposed to right. not offering any communication whatsoever. Right. What you were doing and what Catherine did last week makes your, your the Thomas Jefferson Health District approachable. Um, it, it just it, it gives a good look to what you guys are doing. So I think we're applauding you for this. And also, thank oh. you for. In the encouragement to our industry for telling us we haven't had any complaints. Yeah, we we, <laughs> we are this, we're dude. feeling really yeah. good right now. Yeah, um, yeah. Let me throw well, let you. me throw this to you, Eric. Um, the okay, you 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 guys play a huge role in this community, as you know. And I really appreciated what you said, where you understand the value of 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 the economic impact this could have in the community here. How does you? How do you and some of your colleagues go about weighing this in the scale of justice? Obviously, you're in the business of health and making sure people stay healthy and we head in the right direction. But it sounds like you are certainly very considerate and mindful of the economic impact that's also on the horizon. Your thoughts anywhere you want to go there. Well, I really appreciate it. It's, uh, I guess, speaking as a field inspector, had you know multiple years, many years doing that, working directly with business owners, uh, primarily in the food industry, but also hotels and campgrounds and things like that. I get concerned as a, a public health official if someone is just blowing off like, okay, yeah, my walk-in cooler is at 51, uh, what, what's the problem? You know, at first, they're telling me they're not monitoring things, it should be at 41 degrees, and they're, they're really not applying information that that we the department's already provide provided and and so at that point if we reach a, a you know somewhere that our communication we try multiple ways you know either emails letters uh you know informal fact finding conferences with our director if needed to help them understand the, the public health rationales behind certain regulations because if you have a walk-in cooler at 51 degrees uh you could really really hurt a lot of people and if, if the owner is not taking responsibility or looking at their watch saying, hey, when are you going to get out of here, um, that's when, you know, we have to draw the line as, as you know, I put on the regulatory hat. Most of the time we don't have to wear it. We, we are really, you know, public health ambassadors. That's what we're really trying to do. Uh, but there is that point where, you know, you have to say in, in weighing the, the risk to the public, we, we're going to have to take this action, and we're sorry, you know. And but I know, like just from talking to people, we had Hurricane Isabel, 2003. We had one restaurant lose seven thousand dollars worth of product in in their in their walk-in cooler, but they were doing the right thing. They were, you know, putting it under insurance and throwing it out, not trying to trying to sneak it and save it. So it, there's that that real balance. I'm trying to. That's something I'm trying to get to is. Uh, you know, helping, working with the owner uh, or, or, or the person in charge. But when we reach an impasse, then I'm trained to lean on public health. And if that means some type of sanction that is under due process, which I really appreciate about our regulations, is it's constitutional. We're, we're you know, a, a restaurant permit is like real property. The state just to show up and seize your car. Right. Well, you know, if it's an imminent health risk, we work with the director to get a temporary closure, but then they have every right to come for a meeting and let's, let's resolve this and, and move forward. So I guess, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm talking out of both sides here, but uh, that's kind of my formula that I've learned is, you know, working with people. 
You've been amazing. Yeah, thank you so us, much. Eric. Anything else you'd like to share I, with us? I got us? some warning. Some oh, questions. okay. Sorry, Eric. Jerry, we have Eric. Roll. You have. You're a, like I said, Eric. You're a popular guy. So many questions are coming in for you. Uh, this is a good question. Can you educate us here on on the challenges you guys are facing from a testing standpoint that could create the lag in getting the results for the tests? That I'm not the expert in that. I I know that. Um, we have hired at least five, maybe six contract testing uh, people that we're doing our own uh, testing clinics to more underserved areas in our that we've identified that may not have access to good testing sites. Um, I I don't know the reasons for that you know capacity. I'm sure it's a capacity problem, uh, but I I really. You know, would not want to wade into that without having. That's okay, fair. That's, that's, that's fair. fair. <laughs> that's fair. How about this question here? The challenges ahead for having a home football game in Scott Stadium in Charlottesville. Oh, um, yeah, haven't thought about that yet. I'm still in the locking room. <laughs> but um, the, um, you know, I've heard other states talk about having things socially distanced in the stadium and no concessions and, you know, in-out uh, things. But we would be glad to partner with UVA, you know, looking at, you know, some of these plans. But I, I haven't heard anything locally yet. Okay. So. Um, I got one more for them, and I'll let you go. Sure. Are, are you – if I can ask a personal question, Eric, are you, you a family guy? I, I sure okay. am. Do you feel yep. – would you feel, as someone who is smarter than – pretty much everyone watching this show and certainly the folks talking on the show right here. Do you feel comfortable? What do you feel comfortable doing with your family in this area when you're not on the clock? Well, I guess part of it is my wife works in physical therapy and she's, she works with older population group and um, I love her. She does a great job. I can tell just, just from hearing about her work day. Um, so we've talked because I work in public health and you know, we're, we're very conservative in what we do just, just to help my workplace and to help her workplace. So, you know, it's grocery store runs as gas station and, you know, walks in the parks. And, you know, so we're, you know, maybe a little out of the norm. Um, we haven't gone to a restaurant, you know, we picked up pizza, but, uh, we haven't gone to a restaurant since, you know, late February. So, we're probably not the best example of, you know, but there's reasons behind why we're pretty limited. Uh, we like the outdoors, so that's, that's you know, our outlet right there. That makes perfect sense. All right, final question for you, Eric. Eric, um, we're grateful. You're amazing. Thank you for your honesty and your approachability. This is, um, I think, a, a lesson in public relations of how well the Thomas Jefferson Health District has handled this. Amen. You and Catherine are crushing this. <laughs> we're a platform of hope, but we're also realistic people. You have a lot of people watching you, Eric. Go anywhere you want to go on a, a, on a pandemic that's got a lot of people scared and uncertain. Any, anywhere you want to go, Eric. Ooh. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, getting back that concept of treating others, uh, even when they're angry, uh, you know, trying to understand where they're coming from and, and treat others as, again, as, as you would want to be treated. And um, that, that's, I think it's not only related to the pandemic, I think related to our society right now, and not, not to drift off into any other topics, but um, that mutual respect. Um, I've found it over and over again in my career that even when someone comes in here that, you know, says the health department is a bunch of junk or whatever, uh, but I tell staff, and, I, and I've found this to be true, that, you know, if I treat them with respect, try to take the high road and really talk about what, you know, why we're having them do a certain action to help the public, uh, eventually most people understand we're, we are trying to help. And so whatever... You know, industry you find yourself in, um, you know, trying uh, to, you know, I guess be an ambassador for, you know, if you're working with a family, planning an event, saying, you know, we want your older members to be protected. We, we want you to have a good, loving, wonderful experience. 
However, you know, here's some, some guidelines, and but it's only going to work if, if you cooperate and the venue cooperates and and our, our planning group, you know, cooperates. So, um, you know, maybe maybe I sound like too much of an optimist, but... No, uh, no but know. we didn't ask you the mentoring yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds like you had some wonderful mentors. Would you like to... Um, share one or two with us? Uh, I think, um, you know, I, I think I've had several, uh, you know, environmental health managers, including the cur current one, Jack, he's off today, uh, where I see they're, they're like a level higher and they're, they're dealing with lots of different programs and responses. And so that's, you know, I, I kind of watch people and I want to learn how to be a better leader. So, I, and we've had several health directors, incurring, including the current one, Dr. Bonds, who I can, uh, I, I think they're amazing people. And so I try to learn, you know, how they interact with people and, you know, how did they handle that problem? What are some of their problem solving um, strategies? And so then I work with our staff, you know, trying to, model the right way when I can and um, so that that's um, and we can how. see that you're passing it on yeah we knew we can see that <laughs> dude you're a rock star for sure. what, what is it oh, no. what is the day I, in the life of Eric what, what's your life been like lately uh, I'll be <laughs> honest it, it uh, in the spring was very chaotic because I was pulled off of the food safety because we're just that dropped out kind of like your industry for a while and I was assigned to COVID-19 tracing. So I was, you know, almost every day, you know, in meetings. And then we're calling people who are actively safe. And we're trying to do contact tracing with these folks. Like, okay, where, uh, can, can I permission to call these people? Can we get them to socially isolate for 14 days? Again, trying to flatten that curve of infection. And then, you know, using an interpreter, you know, with, with Spanish speaking folks and um, you know seeing suffering is it was you know you take that home sometimes um, so then that's you know back back into environmental health helping with this interview today doing some other things uh, so I, I, I find if I don't get enough exercise or rest uh, I don't sleep well and I think it's just the nature of what we're all going through and it's probably not just me right. you know yeah, that I'm experiencing right. this and so I kind of have the idea that we're all under this cloud for now. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so that's kind of, you know, my day, every day the phone rings and something else happens. And mm -hmm. Kind of where I am right now. I can relate to that. I can relate to that too. <laughs> I think we yeah. can all relate to that. Eric, you're a rock star dude. I mean, you thank killed you this so interview. Much. Yes. Well, thank you. I, I greatly appreciate this opportunity and, um, you know, I do wish everyone well and, you know, again, do those, those, those protective measures that you've already heard about, you know, through the media and the news and CDC guidelines. I do recommend people visit cdc.gov just for, you know, they have things for businesses. You can go under the business tab and, you know, recommended best practices. That's, that's another thing, a resource there. Thank you for joining us, Eric. Thank you, Eric. All right. Y'all have a great day. Uh, Thank you very you much. You have a good one, too, I guys. might not be finished with you yet. <laughs> I, I think you're going to hear from Barbara again. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson Health District, you killed eight. You killed it. Have a good one. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank, thank Take you care. Thank you. Um, he was fantastic. Yes, absolutely. That was great. Um, guys, give the show a like and a share. We have a lot of comments in. Um, Ray um, is emphasizing, look, it's the venues. The venues are being safe. The folks in weddings that work the weddings are being safe. We can't control the guests. We can't control the guests. I know, I know. Yep. Yeah. And I, I knew they would be. We, uh, my first show with you, I told you that we do our jobs. We do them well, and we, we are up to a challenge. And it, I had no doubt that they would do it well, and they're, they're crushing it. They are. They are crushing mm -hmm. it. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, Jerry, you're yeah. always putting me on the spot. I know, I know. You're a connected lady. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know. You think it'll be, you think it's going to be a 2.5? Yeah, what is that? Does that mean numbers? There's, what does that mean? There's, guys, the meeting, can someone put on the feed, we're 35 minutes into the Albemarle County 
um, Board of Supervisors They could be there meeting. for no. hours. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I know. Someone suggested that yeah. you and I um, call them on the show live. And I was like, we could be on the hold for 90 minutes before we get patched through. <laughs> right. Um, so Gary Grant right. says, valuable local topic. Thank you for covering this and having Ms. Lundgren on the show with you today, Jerry. That's from Gary Grant. Thank you. It's not Ms. Lundgren. It's Barbara. It's Barbara. Yeah. It's Barbara. But she's yeah. amazing. Gary, yeah, yeah. you're the man. Thank you for watching, Gary. You're getting a, a ton of props. Lisa Watson, hello. She's watching. Hi, Lisa. Uh, Wanda Morris, great show. Good information. Claire yeah. Francis, another consideration about weddings is that some guests in, in, inevitably get wasted. And I would imagine that pressing someone like that to follow the yeah, rules could be very difficult. That is a good point. It's hard enough when, you They're know, sober. there's that guy that came to the restaurant and he was sober when he got to the door. But, you know. Then you put a few drinks in him, and I mean, I can't him imagine. or her. Yeah, it doesn't. Matter. I can't even imagine. Yeah. And uh, Jacqueline Greiger's watching. Yeah. she says Jacqueline. people are in grocery stores for twenty to forty minutes. They're at weddings for five to six hours. Yeah, true. Very good point. Um, Andre Xavier says, I'm very, very nervous about the meeting. Um, Ray Cadell is watching both the Albemarle County meeting and us oh, right is now. Oh, really? Oh, good. Brian good. Schornberg says, our test results took 14 days. That's crazy. His took the, This 10. has got to, the, something's got to give there. Yeah. Uh, Lisa says, what's up, Barbara and Jerry? Um, hey, Lisa. That is something that I, you know, if, if it's a 10-day turnaround, what is because the, you're exposed, uh, uh, J- Judah made that point. What's the last value week. of the test? It's the, yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. It, it's, it I guess only for peace time. of mind. I guess. Have you been tested? No. I have not been tested. No, either. I had a friend who got the um, another test. With, um, okay, I'm going blank again. Um, but one friend got tested because there was some exposure at her business, and she called it. I'm, you know, it didn't. It was negative. It was negative. But you know, again, it it took ten days, and you could have been out. I, I think she stayed at home during that time. But there again, it's just so many questions. Cindy Schornberg says, "What's the value of the test if it takes 14 days it, to get the results?" Nothing. Cindy, you're yeah. a smart person. It's um, not, not you working. You did it for get you in the mix eight here. Eight days. You did it eight days, yeah. but you did it for peace of mind for your parents, right? I mean, you pretty much were just throwing them a bone, right? My dad asked me to, but I don't think they're. My parents aren't really that worried about about it. I mean, it's the kind of thing. Like I said, the test is not going to help anyone unless you actually think you have it. And then, mm. oh, hey, now I know I have it. Great. Yeah. Uh, I think the symptoms, it's the symptoms, right? I mean, I th- I'm, I'm thinking the temperature checks are the way to go. And that's what our caterers are doing. The temperature checks? Yeah. That's what ACAC is yeah. doing. Mm-hmm. You walk into ACAC, mm-hmm. I've done it. So what they do when you get to the doctor's they office. They do this. Yep. If you're a reasonable temperature, yep. you can go. You go to the doctor's office, you wait in the car, you text them and tell them, I mean, you call them and tell them you're in the car, they come to the car, take your temperature, and then you can come in. Um, Christelle mm-hmm. Coper, I'm sorry uh-huh. if I'm missing up your name. CNO. Uh, mm-hmm. so you know her? Uh-huh. CNO, she yeah. says they are discussing health district data now at the Albemarle County uh, meeting. Uh-huh. Guys, update us on this. Uh-huh. You're freaking popular. Ira says, <laughs> Been around Thank a you, while. Barbara Lundgren, <laughs> you look great. <laughs> Olivia Branch giving you some props. Now, hey, Olivia's Olivia. tied to lock in. You know we love yep. you here on the show, Olivia. She's our lock in gal. She says, Lock in announced best practices. Should, should there be opportunities, same as schools are planning their return to schools if possible? Um, so everyone is kind of like. We're trying to yeah, live. We're trying to live. Come on. We're just trying to live. And it's so, it's, yeah. Um, questions about schools um, and the numbers. I want your take on the numbers. Um, you're saying about the actual numbers? Mm-hmm. I, wow. This, you're trying to get me in trouble. I'm putting you on the okay, spot. <laughs> do, you want, do you want my actual real take? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. this is going to get me in trouble. I said this to my wife, and she said, Jerry, if you want, I can say it. I'll okay. Say, we both are agreeing. Exactly. So you, can you get a snapshot of the CDC, the numbers, that I can leverage 
for this for this conversation. Okay. Shelby okay. Mulher Friedman, Walsingham Academy Unite. The she, numbers I showed you? Yeah, from CDC. Shelby Mulher Friedman says, it's a shame that so many are waiting that long for results. We just got swab tested in a walk-in clinic in New York and got results back in 15 minutes. So why don't we have If testing was this that? easy for everyone, we would be in yeah. a much better place. Shelby Mulher Freeman, Shelby Mulher Freeman, amen, Shelby Mulher Freeman. 15 minutes in New York. So why don't, where is that test? I think they're at capacity here. Uh, I think they don't have the reason, the personnel. All right, so I'm going to say something that I think is going to irk some people, but you know what? I've done this many, many times on the show. It won't be your first this time, is right, what Jerry? <laughs> when you give your opinion often in front of a lot of people. You have the data? Uh, just about. Okay, so guys, I feel that, and I'm going to throw it to you. I feel that the media is undoubtedly manipulating this story to drive um, views to their website, to drive readership, to drive subscriptions. The media is exploiting um, deaths that otherwise could have been deaths from other things and mm -hmm. not COVID. Mm -hmm. The media is choosing to focus on number of cases, hospitalizations, Instead of focusing on things like, how did people do once they were tested? How long did it take mm -hmm. for them to get back to there? Mm -hmm. or, or Judah, you jump in here with the conversation we were talking about. They're choosing to focus on the negative as opposed to the positive. We're not going to go down the election route. I think undoubtedly what's happening is this is being done to influence a November election. I'm going to leave that alone mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. But I, the, the media is choosing to focus on negative things instead of positive things. And unfortunately, it's needed. scaring a lot of people. All right, Judah, put it on screen. What are you going to put on screen before you put on screen? Uh, I've got it on screen now. It's the it's deaths involving coronavirus, and it shows the number of deaths updated July 22nd. Um, this is through the entire year, um, and then it shows deaths from all causes. It shows. Uh, let's see what else is there. Okay, so here's a statistic that's worth considering, and I'm going to throw it to you. The average human in America dies at what age? Anyone? Anyone? The average human in America dies at 79, 79 years old. The average human dies at 79. Do you know the average age of a COVID death? 82. <laughs> Think about the metric. Yeah, they're, they're, they're reporting deaths as COVID that are not COVID. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm hearing that all the time. Right. And it's because we know that the hospitals get a little bit more money if it's a COVID Here's death. Here's a question back to the media. Yeah. What about people like me who are start starting to tune them out? I'm not listening to them anymore. You're what not a, listening to I'm any not, media. I'm not. I used outside to outside the I Love Seville show. No, there you go, Jerry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you're starting no, to do I'm, that because I'm, what, was it getting you demoralized and depressed? Exactly. Right. Exactly. It's too much. It's too it's much. Too much. They're not. They need to recognize that that we are tuning them out. And their sponsors need to recognize that. It, it's just too much. Regina Dodd. Yes, Jerry.